All right, Nate is up next. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, and thanks again uh, to the conference sponsors. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Again, my name is Nate Johnson. I'm the Director of Environmental Affairs and also the Director of Business Development for ORPC and ORPC Solutions. And, uh, you know, it's a tough assignment that Chris uh, asked us to uh, deliver here on today is uh, a challenge and a success. We've had numerous successes and, and certainly a multitude of challenges, which goes along with technology development. So I'll do my best to, to define that in more detail. So I think a lot of folks in the room know who ORPC are, but uh, some brief background. We were founded in 2004. We're headquartered in Portland with offices in Alaska, Quebec, and Ireland. Um, we have numerous technology and research partners with national labs and, uh, and also many universities. And the University of Maine has played a key role in our um, development um, uh, expertise, especially on the school of marine science side of things. I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail. We've had five generations of different technologies and 11 in-water deployments, uh, which has uh, allowed us to really learn uh, around our technology and, and uh, in-water activities. We've delivered power to shore from our hydrokinetic devices in both a tidal and a river environment, um, which as far as we know, we're the only company in the world to do that. Uh, we've also, because we do technology development and project development, we've been very successful in navigating the complex regulatory um, and, uh, and environmental issues that we've had to face, de-risking projects, and uh, have gained a lot of attention for that. And, and part of our success on the development side has led others in the industry to come to us for our expertise. So several years ago, we established ORPC Solutions, which is our strategic services arm, to provide services to others in the industry. So we've worked in the wave energy sector, um, we've worked in the offshore wind sector from Alaska, to Ireland, so we've been uh, very successful and it's, it's something we enjoy doing as well. Giving it a few minutes here <laughs> to catch up. Okay, so here's our power systems and, uh, and there's also some information on the back that I think uh, Gail's group has put out as well. Our, the top picture shows our TIGEN device and, and these are all examples of what we call our TGU, our turbine generator unit. So our Technology is a cross-flow turbine that generates power from the velocity of oceans and, and river currents. So we look for, for places in the world where there's high currents that can drive those turbines and, and be economically viable. In 2012, we installed in Cobbsuk Bay. I'm going to talk about that in more detail. 2014, we tested a prototype that incorporated a buoyancy pod and a mooring system. And in uh, 2014 and 2015, we deployed uh, a smaller version that we call RivGen in a remote village in Alaska, which has been uh, an incredible success. And that's using a different um, delivery platform that we call our pontoon support structure to submerge the device and, and, and bring it back to the surface. So success. In 2012, and I apologize to Bruce because I couldn't fit Newfoundland on this image, um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, to provide some perspective, we deployed our, our Tygen device in Cobbsuk Bay, which is um, in Eastport and Lubeck, Maine, which is on the border with New Brunswick. It's just, uh, just to the west of Eastport, and it's on the, at the mouth of the Bay of Fundy. And uh, this installation was uh, the first FERC-licensed um, hydrokinetic project to send power to a grid. Um, in fact, it was the first ocean en energy device of any kind to send power to the grid in the Americas, with the exception of uh, tidal barrage, which folks in the room from Nova Scotia are probably aware there's a tidal barrage in Annapolis Royale um, in Nova Scotia. So the Cobbsuk Bay project um, really was a huge techn technological achievement for us and the industry. We were able to, to really say this technology works. Uh, we were able to send power to the grid. We have a power purchase agreement where we were able to sell the power. We were able to um, get wrecks for the power. We were able to demonstrate local economic development opportunities. And, uh, and also, we were, once you get to in the water, you actually is when you really start to learn things. And we were able to learn how we can do things better all the time. And the lower picture is an example. We retrieved the Taijin device in 2013 using a special purpose vessel that drastically reduced the cost 
um, of deploying and retrieving these devices and, and reduce the time from weeks to just hours um, in terms of retrieval. So that was a huge success for us. <clears throat> Similarly, um, we were also very successful in doing environmental monitoring and learning about how our devices interact with the environment. And Gail Zedleski and her team at the University of Maine have been really integral in, in that process. And it's also very transferable to sites all over the world. Um, there's been a lot of interest from folks in Nova Scotia, um, folks uh, in Ireland and Scotland about the methods and technologies that were implemented in Cobsuk Bay and, and how we went about trying to determine what the actual effects of these devices are, which, which is minimal, uh, if any, that, that we've been able to find. So the University of Maine did um, fish studies using both hydroacoustics and trawl surveys. This is a hydroacoustic image that was actually done subsequent to our tide uh, deployment. It it's shows the bottom support frame, which is basically the, the um, foundation for Tygen here, and shows our moored device, the Octane prototype, um, to the to the uh, right of that. Um, and and the this is typical fish finder images of, of images of um, fish tracks as well around the device. And another example of um, transferable um, environmental studies that we did is we worked collaboratively, co collaboratively with Dr. Mo Brown from the New England Aquarium on marine mammal surveys and she uh, trained our staff as well as community observers to perform marine mammal observations during construction and installation and then subsequently she did perform the same service for folks in Nova Scotia so using many of the same practices. However you know, there's a lot of challenges. Our, what we've learned is that we need to drastically reduce the cost of our technology in order to compete and open up markets. So we have an approach that we've developed to try to get into those early adopter markets and be effective and grow to scale. So th there's a combination of, of ways that we've determined to do that. And this is a big challenge for us. It's a big challenge for the industry um, and really a big challenge for a lot of folks working in ocean technology. So. You know, the early adopter markets we've identified as, as the markets where there's above market price incentives or the remote markets with diesel generation. And that's a big market. There's approximately 700 million people in the world that use diesel for their generation and another 1.3 billion people that don't even have access to electricity. So it's, it's, it, there's also huge social and economic impacts that result from doing work in remote communities. So that's been a big focus of uh, ours in the last few years to try to um, be able to compete today with our technology cost and make a difference in these communities. And then also to continually reduce our costs and grow to scale. So an example of that that I've mentioned previously is our project in Alaska. So in Alaska, they, play, they pay close to, in this community in Alaska, which is a river community um, called Igiagig, on the Quijack River, they pay close to a dollar kilowatt hour for, for their um, energy. And they also have to ship diesel or fly diesel into the community, which is an environmental risk. We deployed there in 2014, and again in 2015, we were able to demonstrate providing about a third of the village's power using our um, Rivgen power system. We were able to really de-risk some of the environmental. Um, this is one of the biggest uh, salmon runs in North America, um, sockeye salmon runs. It's a commercial fishery in the area. The Quijack River drains out to Bristol Bay. And we were able to really determine that there was minimal impact, if any, on the salmon runs. And, and Dr. Zizleski has been involved in, in some aspects of um, this work as well. And this project gained a lot of attention. Um, it was a terrific success story for us. Last fall, President Obama and Secretary of State Kerry did their Arctic mission to Alaska and they highlighted this project as one of the examples of, of technologies and, and projects that can make a difference in the Arctic. Um, there's also, I believe the presentations will probably be available afterwards, there's a, a nice link that shows a press report as well on this project. And then most recently, just this Tuesday, we were awarded the National Hydropower Association's Outstanding Stewards of America's Water Award, which is the first uh, hydrokinetic project to receive that award. So we're very proud of that. <clears throat> One of the challenges working in remote communities is, is trying to understand 
um, some of the uh, environmental factors that impact availability. So you, know, you want to be able to operate year round and there's certainly some risks associated with these tough environments. So we're doing work um, in partnership with uh, our subsidiary in Quebec with uh, a native corporation called Makovic Corporation, Hydro-Quebec's research division, IREC, as well as Laval University to uh, in what we call our winter hydraulics program. So this is developing predictive tools for frazzle ice development and also trying to determine what the impacts of frazzle ice development on structures are. And this uh, image on the right was taken two weeks ago in a village called Kujwak, which is in northern uh, Quebec in Nunavik. And we were deploying um, instrumentation to, to monitor the resource, measure the resource in Kujwak. And finally, um, you know, another big piece is to continuously innovate to bring down costs. And it's a huge uh, initiative of ORPC. We think about it every day. And what we're doing on our next generation devices, which is a big focus for us this year, is incorporating these cross-platform advancements, whether it be on our Octane prototype or our RivGen or TieGen, to really go to the next generation device that's going to uh, maximize efficiency and also reduce costs. This is our advanced TieGen that is, we anticipate will be the next generation device. It will incorporate that floating buoyancy pod and tension leg mooring system. We are in the process of finalizing a project with DOE on the next generation generator, which is going to be built by Rolls-Royce Marine in Norway. And we're also incorporating some of the advancements that we have seen um, from the fairing design and the rib gen to really increase output on the device itself and, and, uh, and bring down costs. And finally, I wanted to talk about another project that we're very excited about, which is our ARPA-E drone technology. And ARPA-E, for those that don't know it, is the Advanced Research Project um, Division of DOE. It's a very competitive um, solicitation that we were awarded last fall. And we'll be looking at uh, incorporating variable pitch into our foils so we can generate thrust and actually um, deploy these devices to, their, to the sites using their own propulsion and drastically, drastically reducing O&M costs and increasing efficiency. And in doing so, open, also open up broad markets for underwater um, uh, exploration, defense, and uh, heavy lift purposes. So um, that's, RPE likes to fund out their ideas, but um, it's something that we're excited about and, and really feel we could, could be very transformational for the industry. So with that, thank you for your time and I look forward to the questions.